Hey everyone, welcome back to part two of Making It Work, Supporting Students with Disabilities During Math Instruction. So when the video cut off, cut off we were talking about students whom sometimes adults might look at and say that in class we have a bad kid or a lazy kid or someone who's just unmotivated, unwilling to try, unhelpful, I mean, <coughs> you name it, and some negative terms have been associated with kids. And I think what we really need to recall for any of us personally and for our students, when content instruction is difficult, incredibly difficult, beyond our ability to understand, and when we're required and mandated by law to be in a class, it is not our choice. It is not something we signed up for willingly often. But these are things that we are told you know, as, as children, as teenagers, we have to be in this class, we have to finish it, we have to pass it. Even though it's a significant challenge for us, that can often lead to some behaviors that we ourselves might exhibit when put in the same situation. So there are lots of classroom management tips that we can put into place to make our classrooms welcoming and understanding, providing students with a safe environment to explore content that is challenging. And often we need to remind ourselves that behind the behaviors we're seeing, there's often a reason. So for many of us, instead of thinking about how hard the content is or how much we need students to do, and maybe we can stop for a minute and appreciate that when things are really hard for any of us, often we want to walk away, but our students don't have that option. They need to stay in our class. They have to finish our content. Um, so often the presentation of that content is key. So when we're looking at some behaviors we commonly see in our classrooms, teachers often say that one of the most challenging behaviors are students who are considered off task or not engaged in the tasks that we need to, them to be engaged in. So here are some strategies and some supports we can put in place to support the on-task behavior that we want. And some of them you know, are super easy for us to implement. Things like um, letting students use a timer, giving students extended time if they need additional time to finish work. Many of our students really benefit from this very top uh, modification, this top support, where we're giving students chunking of assignments. So rather than giving them an entire assignment at one time, which could be overwhelming, giving them part of an assignment to start with. Over here are some specially designed instruction that we can use to support students are some really great common sense strategies. You know, explicit instruction and in how students could use self-talk to help support them as they're walking through a difficult task. Giving them um, some differential reinforcement or some supports to encourage that behavior. And helping students understand how they can self-monitor and evaluate their progress in class giving some explicit instruction in how to break down um, a task into smaller pieces, using graphic, <coughs> excuse me, using graphic organizers, um, helping students understand um, some different ways that they can take notes to support their learning, giving them some pre-teaching of assignments, scaffolding some instruction, and helping students understand how to take appropriate breaks. So all of these supports and instruction strategies can help students with their on-task behavior. There are many more that are available in the lesson plan handbook that you might find beneficial, either the strategy itself or just the concept that leads you to another idea that would support the students with whom you're working. One strategy that I use a lot, because I'll be honest, math is not my strongest academic subject. And so when I'm doing something that's a complex math problem or a complex complex analytical situation where I really have to work through multiple phases of a problem, I use the PREMAC principle, otherwise known as Grandma's Law. And so for a lot of us, when we went to a respected adult's house in our lives and they had a meal that we didn't prefer, they would say things to us like, eat your carrots, then you can have a cupcake or ice cream. And this same PREMAC principle or Grandma's Law can apply in academic tasks. So when we know a task is hard for a student, then following up with a preferred task is best to help them power through that topic. So an example that we can use in the classroom is, do your best on these five problems, then you can skip one. Or complete this activity, and then you can skip a problem on homework, or maybe have no homework for the evening. 
I always try and think through a few things. One, what is my ultimate learning goal? What's the learning target here? Is it required that a student show me a hundred times they can do it right or does five really suffice? And then other people will say, well, I don't feel like it's fair to allow one student to skip homework when I don't allow all students. To which my question is, could all students do it that way? Is it possible that if everyone does their best on the work in class that no homework might be possible? In my world, yes, that would be applicable. Um, you'll have to make the decision if that works in your world. But definitely we can set up situations so that all students can work towards that motivation of what works best for them, finish a task that's harder, and then do something that is easier, even if that's just taking a three minute chill down break. For a lot of us, that's enough to help us power through a complex, complicated or stressful situation. So let's talk about some co-teaching models. For those of us that are fortunate to have a co-teaching situation where a general education teacher and a special education teacher are working together, <clears throat> there are lots of different ways we can co-teach, and some of them um, have more research behind them to be effective at increasing student engagement and student achievement. For all of us, I think co-teaching is always worth taking a shot. Give it a try and see how it works for you. Um, note that for a lot of our models of co-teaching, it takes practice to get good at it, just like riding a bike. So if you try one of the um, higher evidence-based practices in co-teaching once and think, whoo, that lesson didn't go as well as I'd like, I'd encourage you to give it another try um, to see what works well for you. So I've got here checked the four types of co-teaching that have um, higher evidence for increasing student engagement and student success. And those four are station teaching and parallel teaching, alternative teaching, and teaming. One teach, one observe, and one teach, one assist are often used, but have a lower evidence of success. Um, and the reasons for that are pretty obvious as we start moving through the models. So if you think through each model of co-teaching, the two that have the X's by them have one teacher teaching a large group of students and another teacher providing some support. These models are helpful sometimes, but they're not going to increase student learning in the way that the other models are because students are only hearing from one adult sharing one way to learn. Um, let's look at station teaching first. <coughs> Excuse me. When we use station teaching, we're breaking up the number of students who are learning, so we're increasing that one-to-one -one, um, time with students, that smaller student-to-teacher ratio, and we're allowing students to learn content often in different ways or have different practice opportunities with two certified teachers providing that support. Often in station teaching, you'll have a situation where you might have two teacher-directed stations and then one station where students are doing independent practice that, again, can be checked and supported by one of the two certified teachers. In parallel teaching, both teachers are often delivering the same content, but just to a smaller group of students at the same time, which allows for increased um, watching of each student. It gives more students an opportunity to respond. If I'm in this big class and I'm calling on students, I'm not going to make it through as many students who can share. In parallel teaching, I can allow multiple students to respond here. Multiple students are responding here. This is a larger number than just with one teach, one observe. In alternative teaching, uh, one teacher is working with usually a larger group teaching a main concept, and then this teacher might pull students for a short amount of time to maybe reinforce a strategy, pre-teach a strategy, or to dig deep on one part of a strategy. In teaming, both teachers are teaching at the same time, often sharing different ways to solve problems. So maybe you're looking at two different formulas or two different <coughs> methodologies you could use to solve the same problem. Um, but it's a good opportunity for students to see how two different ways of looking at something um, can lead to a good result. There's a lot more great information about the four highly effective methods of co-teaching. If you'd like more information, please let me know or um, do some YouTube searching. There are excellent videos modeling how to use those co-teaching models. Many of our students are super smart and um, can look at problems with a different logic than we do. And while we count cannot always account for every single trick question. Um, we can plan for multiple 
student misconceptions in learning. A few ways we can do that are providing students with <coughs> excuse me, supports like Khan Academy where they can go back and look at the key learnings over and over again where they couldn't always hear us teach that in class multiple times. They can watch videos made at Khan Academy or teacher created videos that we make to support students. Giving students access to virtual learning manipulatives that they can use to support their learning outside of class are crucial. And us watching videos like the teaching channel are super helpful to engage our students. If you haven't downloaded the Kentucky Common Core app, this is a fantastic way to work through the Common Core to look at the standards and different ways that we can provide student supports. And when you click on each standard, you're going to go into all kinds of resources and supports for each of the Common Core. It's an excellent free app. If you haven't gone to KDE's Math Design Collaborative and looked through some of the lesson plans that they have there, both elementary and high school, those are fantastic resources. Most of the lessons in the MARS website, this Math Assessment Project website, have great information on thinking, <coughs> excuse me, thinking through student misconceptions. It is an excellent teacher resource. There are lots of other good resources out there like Math IXL, where students can engage in learning and practice opportunities that are fun and interesting. Students like to be able to go to a website and practice problems, so websites like Math IXL are excellent resources. If you have any questions, please let me know. I'm always happy to help. My um, email is included in the resources, and you can catch me here at lara.clark at eku. Edu. I hope you found something important um, in what I've shared today, and if you'd like more information, don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks for learning with me.